Hey, gang. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I just got back from flying through a major hurricane. Yes, through the hurricane. Here's what that was like. Now I've done a lot of storm chases, I've been through a lot of hurricanes, never have I flown into one. Most aircraft fly like away from the storm, trying to avoid it, and pilots are trained to avoid storms at all costs. These guys on board the Hurricane Hunters are trained to literally fly directly into the core of the storm, and I can tell you it was like going on a roller coaster through a car wash. It was nuts. Now, Lee was a major hurricane when we encountered it, meaning winds of 115 miles per hour going around and around inside the eye wall, that ring of winds around the eye. We went through the eye like six or seven times, and every time it got worse and worse and worse. Ironically, one of the toughest parts was getting from Washington, D.C. down to St. Croix to fly with the Hurricane Hunters, because when you find out you get a ticket on board this flight, it's on such short notice that like you gotta book your tickets and get down there ASAP. So I flew from DC down to Fort Lauderdale, but my flight out of DC was delayed four or five hours due to heavy rain. And I was sitting there like, how funny is it that I can't take off into a rainstorm, yet I'm about to fly into a major hurricane. So flew out of Fort Lauderdale, slept there the night, got back into Spirit Airlines flight, and I've flown Spirit Airlines before. I actually love Spirit Airlines, even though they're like the mega bus of the skies. So anyway, I get on this flight in Fort Lauderdale. It's nap time, it's like 1 p.m. And the lady in front of me to my left in the aisle seat has had a lot to drink, which, you know, it's airplanes. I've had a few drinks before too, but like a lot. To the point where she's like drunk telling stories about her hamster died when she was in third grade in Mrs. Sullivan's class and all these things and like now she's drunk crying and the couple next to her is like my age and they're like trying to be supportive and stuff and pat her in the back there there it's okay and then she starts going on and on about hats and how she went to Hawaii and got this $700 hat for only $200 and she pulls out like the most hideous hat you could possibly imagine it looks like a cowboy hat combined with a party hat with feathers and sparkles and like, I swear it was part Christmas tree, like there were ornaments hanging off. And just like in Dr. Seuss, she turns the couple and slurs like, do you like my hat? And the couple's like, yeah, like, it's really nice. So then she insists they try it on and they do. And she's like, but I have others. And she starts pulling hats out of the bag. And it's like, you, you know those clown cars where you're shocked that many clowns can fit in the car? I swear, like in her purse, there must've been 15 different hats and she just keeps pulling them out and handing them to the people around her and will not let this young couple rest until they can see that like they will take a hat home, like they will wear this hat off the plane. It was something. Anywho, after quite the ordeal and quite the show, I finally got to St. Croix, which I quickly learned is the only place under US jurisdiction where folks drive on the left side of the road, which I probably should have Googled ahead of time, but live and learn. So as soon as we land, we have a couple hours like chill, decompress before this mission. We get back to the hotel. It's a nice hotel, it's on the beach. Got a little bit of food, but we didn't want to eat much because we knew once we got on this flight, it would be pretty rocky and odds are anything that went down would come back up. After dinner, it was time for a quick swim. Water temperatures were amazing, like 84, 85 degrees. There was also high altitude cloud cover fanning away from Lee, making for an epic sunset. Then it was time for bed at least for a couple hours. 1.45 a.m. came early. I got up, ironed a shirt, and met Jack by the car. The road to the airfield was probably as bumpy as the flight. NOAA flight engineers gave us a quick briefing on the ground, and then it was time to board the aircraft. It was a heavily modified P-3 Orion that NOAA had purchased back in the 1970s. It's been through hundreds of hurricanes and is named after the Muppet, Miss Piggy. Now these aircraft are heavily modified. There are only two like them. Most don't have this weird bump out in the back, this tail. That's a Doppler radar in there, in addition to the one in the front, so they can get as much data as possible inside the storm. Then over here, another Doppler radar inside the nose of the aircraft. Then these tube-like things here take in air and it's used for cloud microphysics research and droplet research. 
It's tough to appreciate just how big these propellers are until I'm next to them for scale. There are four of these on this aircraft, but they're more reliable than jet engines. That's why they're still in use. Now, a lot of people have heard the term hurricane hunters before, but there are actually two different groups of hurricane hunters. One is through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We flew with them on their P-3 Orion aircrafts, but the U.S. Air Force also has a wing dedicated to aircraft weather reconnaissance. They're the 53rd Squadron, and usually NOAA and the Air Force kind of work together. They might alternate missions. Sometimes they fly together at the same time. So you've been doing this, you said, here on, on this plane for about two years. Before that, you were in the Navy for a long time, correct? Yeah, I was in the Navy for about 11 years. Gotcha. Uh, flying the P-3 Orion, so same platform, just different model uh, of this aircraft. And so getting ready for a day, obviously there's no typical day of work, but what is like the most typical day of work look like for you? Oh, uh, well, essentially you wake up at crazy hours, depending on what your mission is going to be. For example, I woke up at 1 o'clock today to be here for this flight. Uh, Brush your teeth, put on your pants. I, I usually wear shorts, t-shirt, come in, get the plane ready. So pre-flight again, make sure all my systems are working properly, which are the engines, uh, get the APU fired up. So the guys in the back can check their radar system and uh, go fly for about eight hours, come back, land, put the plane to bed, which means do a thorough post-flight inspection, similar to a pre-flight, but you just make sure the way that it was is, yeah, you know, the way that it, it's going to be ready for the next mission, yeah. essentially, uh, trying to give it that heads up. And if you do find something that's broken, you can get it fixed before the next mission. So by post flight support it, head back to the hotel, get something to eat, and then start it over again. Uh, so I guess last question then. Uh, obviously, there's there's no you know, flight simulator that simulates flying into a hurricane. How do you guys train for something like this? Because in a Navy, like you said, you avoid the weather. Here, you're plowing into it. Uh, the best way I can say it is uh, I live pretty close to Universal Studios, so I just got on a bunch of roller coasters and just went on repeat to that. SeaWorld was there, went on those roller coasters, and that's really the only way you can. It's flying through a hurricane is very similar to riding a really crappy wooden roller coaster. So, yeah, that's the best way. So the main purpose of these Hurricane Hunters flights is to fly into the heart of the storm to figure out the essential pressure, the temperature, the wind speed, all this stuff that we can't really get anywhere else. You know, there are satellites in space that peer down, but they can't see under the hood, so to speak. They can't really see below the central dense overcast into the core of the storm. Likewise, we don't really have radar over the open ocean, and so we know there's this big spinning buzzsaw of winds, but we don't know the central pressure, and we don't know how fast those winds are unless we fly directly into it. So the data goes in real time to the National Heart Center in Florida. They're in Miami. They're like NOAA's and the National Weather Service's big central forecasting operations for hurricanes. And they take in this data and they say, how strong is the storm now? But they also feed this really fine-tuned data into forecast models specific for hurricanes, which sort of churn it out and figure out what's going to happen next with the storm. And so if we don't have this data from inside the storm, forecasting and modeling is nowhere near what it could be. So that's why this data they collect is so unbelievably valuable. There were 22 people on board. A team consists of pilots, flight engineers, meteorologists, navigators, technological officers, and researchers. You can imagine my non-weather friends definitely had some questions when they texted me asking where I was, and I replied simply, riding Miss Piggy. Now, I wasn't nervous until the captain gave us the safety briefing in the event of a water landing, but this wasn't that. And then he was like, all right, here are your ditching stations. If we got a crash land in the water, I was like, on Delta they say water landing. If we got a crash land in the water because we're out of fuel, you know, go go to, to this station. There's gonna be a life jacket with a Swiss Army knife inside. I'm like, normal flights, they don't let you bring on a butter knife. And so like you have actual survival gear in this bag. And this pilot has flown through everything. I mean, he he's the real deal. These people have an unbelievable amount of experience. And obviously, Noah is making sure all the precautions are taken. But it was just weird to hear the safety briefing like that, Frank, that matter of fact. So yeah, we, we got to take off. It's a normal flight. Until it's not a normal flight. And that's when things start getting a little rocky. We 
When you're flying through a hurricane, we know there's gonna be a lot of turbulence. Like, I was expecting that. However, it really wasn't that bad until we got to the eye wall. And the eye wall is like that donut of extreme winds, the buzzsaw that goes around the eye. The eye is that calm center, but there's this ring of intense wind and thunderstorm activity around the eye. We found something really weird though. We got that initial big burst of wind and rain, and then like a lull. And then we found another one, and it turns out there was not one but two eye walls. One was 70 miles wide, the outer one, then a more compact, intense inner one that was only 20 miles wide. So we just went through the eye wall again. The exit wasn't as bad as the entry. Why was that? Right, so what we think is happening is uh, potentially a secondary eye wall formation. And when that happens um, on one side, you might get an an open end for the eye wall. So when we came in, we had a complete semicircle of an eye wall. And when we came out, that other semicircle was not there. So it didn't seem so bad, but what ended up happening is a little further out, approximately twice the distance of the original RFW, see maybe a secondary eye wall formation. And the wind, se wind speed seemed to support that. So RMW raised maximum winds. Uh, what kind of wind speeds are we seeing? Um, I think right now at the surface we're seeing between 105 and 110 knots. It really depends on the instrumentation and usually we rely on uh, the National Hurricane Center to look at all the different observations and make their best assessment of the situation. So we encountered the storm at a really cool time when it was undergoing an eye wall replacement cycle. Basically, the inner one shrivels up, falls into the eye, and the outer one forms. And so we didn't get as strong a winds as we could have if there was only one eye wall, but that double eye wall is such a valuable data set because rarely like, do we get to fly into storms at the same time they're reshuffling, reorganizing. And we did one pass, another pass, another pass. I think we did like five passes. And so every time we were seeing the evolution of that double eye wall, and that's something they'll be studying for a really long time, I guarantee it. And in that time frame, like, are we seeing a quick evolution of it? Like, are, are things changing? Today? Yeah, I mean, in a eye wall formation, a second eye wall formation, eye wall replacement cycle, it can evolve pretty quickly. And so, um, Later in the flight, so early in the flight, we're doing passes that are less uh, often, about 40 to 45 minutes, I think. Um, but as we get later in this flight, we may do some more passes across that. Yeah. We may do a secondary animal, a module, which basically show a little bit more structure. So this is good not just for like the National Hurricane Center now, but research-wise. I mean, this oh, yeah. must be a value for data. Oh yeah, it's really exciting actually. Uh, it's, it's it'll be really interesting to see. We we still don't fully understand secondary owl formation. It's very difficult to forecast. Yep. And, uh, and so, you know, it's very important for intensity as well, obviously. So we're really interested in trying to understand that a little bit better. Yeah. When we got inside the eye itself, it wasn't like this perfect hollowed out eye like you sometimes see in the movies. It was a little murky, a little overcast, a little gray, but it was weird because the big tall clouds kind of gave way. And I looked out the window and I saw this big sloping, it looked like a mountain, if you will, like this mountain of cloud cover towering 20,000 feet over us on our southeast side and then kind of sloping down like a bowl shape. And I realized we're in the eye and we're seeing what we call the stadium effect. Picture like if you're in the middle of a football stadium and you look around and on all sides you get like the, the bleachers rising up around you and kind of surrounding you and expanding upwards and outwards. That's what it was like to be inside the eye. It didn't stick around like that for long, but it was so cool to see. And I've wanted to see that since I was like eight years old. So that was a bucket list item right there to see the stadium effect, even if it wasn't super clean, was so damn cool. I think that was on our second pass through the eye. And then we did a third pass and a fourth pass and a fifth pass. And the turbulence wasn't super bad, but it was constant. Like imagine going down a gravel or, or a cobblestone road for like six hours on end. Even if you never get car sick, you're gonna get car sick from that because it's just constant nonstop. I have to say, I thought that skipping breakfast would be a smart move, but it turns out that you can still puke on an empty stomach. See, the good news is, I skipped breakfast, so it's only dry heat, but I do need a Tic Tac. This will be full by the end of the flight. Yeah, after that, like three or four times of dry heaves, Jack, who was behind the camera, gave me a drama bean, and like this, I was out. I've never fallen asleep that fast. In the end, we made four passes through the eye. Then after an eight hour flight, it was finally time to touch down. But 
finally, after everything was said and done, we landed. They had some great data and it was so cool. All right, so there's good news and bad news. The good news, we made it down to the ground. Things are not moving anymore. I'm not dry heaving anymore, which is good. Uh, the bad news is the cupcakes did not survive. Jack and I were gonna try to have some cupcakes earlier on on the flight, and not only did they not survive, but I don't think we would have survived if we actually consumed any food at 10,000 feet. I had some crackers and that was about it. But yeah, A for effort. <laughs> But Noah was so unbelievably accommodating. They let us sit in the cockpit. They let us sit anywhere we wanted. We got to talk to everybody on board. There were some really fascinating, good people doing some really good science. And ultimately, those folks are a lot braver than most other meteorologists would be. And they get the data that helps us do what it is we do. And because of them, over the years, the cone for hurricanes has shrunk markedly. Like the, the accuracy with which we can forecast now compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago is night and day. Thanks to the fact that there are these people out there who are willing to fly headfirst into these storms and get that data we need. Follow My Radar on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.